Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Hope you're having a great, what do we call it? House arrest, martial law, lockdown, quarantine. Hope you're holding on to what little sanity you might have. That's the problem around this place. Luckily, I have a dog to remind me of what well, what's really important in life and maybe you're just as lucky big debate tonight today whenever you're listening flushers versus pointers all in good fun you and i both know that they're excellent all of them and we'll get into that debate and your calls coming up very soon on the podcast coming to you from the cabela's podcast studio We'll also have uh, some hunting strategy and tactics, some dog care advice, another place to hunt for free, public access in our This Land is Your Land uh, feature. And uh, who knows what else might happen. We got a bunch of callers already on the line waiting to talk. So, um, you know, let's get to it. First off, just finished, in fact, just went live a few days ago with uh, the first video in the series. I'm calling it Hope help hunt 2020 it's an effort to uh, remind everybody that yes we will have a hunting season i don't care what your governor says we'll be out there we'll be chasing our dogs and hopefully shooting at wild birds or preserved birds or all of the above depending on your cup of tea as they say so um get a look at it you can see it at youtube on my channel there you can watch it on my website findbirdhuntingspots.com and on the facebook pages that i administer as well hope help hunt 2020 in addition to um, keeping you focused on the hunting season to come i'm also helping out some of the nonprofit organizations that basically lost their banquet season including uh, this week's beneficiary the ruffed grouse society so give you a little nudge toward maybe maybe spending a few bucks with them even if you didn't get to go to your chapter's banquet this year and finally some hunting video that should get you fired up if nothing else about the upcoming season so uh that is um you know that is how that goes and uh, i'm hoping you'll support rgs this time around and get a good look at the video and of course if you if you watch it all the way through, there's a special offer at the end. You might win yourself a Dogtra TNB dual collar. And you'll also have a good time. You'll learn some things about hunting. You'll learn some things about places to go. And uh, hopefully, you'll be a little bit more psyched up about the coming season. Okay, caller's already on the line, so I'm going to make this quick. Sage and Breaker is one of our charter sponsors sageandbreaker.com sign up for their mailing list gun care products crafted at the highest caliber and uh, some blog posts by me over there so if you want to see me writing about guns a uh, subject i i know so little about i have to get creative and that's the fun part i think you'll enjoy how i uh provide a slightly different take on what guns are to me at least at sageandbreaker.com and I mentioned Dogtra already, but learn more about Dogtra at Dogtra.com. The TNB Dual, no toggling required. They got a lot of bundled products on sale right now. And uh, I'll be talking in more detail about them as we get down deeper into the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Thank you so much for listening. Now let's get to the phones. Yeah, as I said, the topic tonight, uh, pointers versus flushers. Our first caller is Christine. Christine, start off with the the inevitable question. What kind of dogs are you hunting with? I have a two-year-old English Springer Spaniel. Okay, I guess that settles the question then. Why would you pick a Springer? Um, I have liked them for a long time. I, I like the way they look. I like their energy. Um I had never hunted with one until I got mine, but <laughs> I just liked what I saw of other people's. And since you got it and you have hunted with it, what's, uh, what's your take on that whole idea? Um, it's a lot of fun. You really have to know, you really have to know your dog and um, keep an eye on what he's doing all the time. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? That's probably the gripe I have about, uh, 
about flushing breeds. You can't <laughs> you can't talk about football or the book the book you read last week or anything else, can you? No, not really. You got to really really be watching for the signs that he's getting birdie. Well, you know, uh, I joke about it, and I, I've written about it in a book or two as well. But uh, how do you know when your Springer is getting birdie? Um. Well, he'll be he'll be out there and we'll be you know walking along and he um he kind of he's kind of a goofball so he's kind of goofing around springing around and it's when he kind of gets serious puts his nose to the ground and he'll start quartering and his tail will be going and then i know i gotta pay attention oh that's funny so uh, <laughs> i i in fact i just cut a, a a tv show where i mentioned offhand to somebody that with labradors the tail goes in a circle uh, yep. <laughs> is the same for your Springer? No, nope, his his was dock short, so his just goes back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And what do you love to hunt the most? Um, rough grouse. Yeah. Well, you're up there in uh, in that country, aren't you? I am. I'm in northern Minnesota. Nice. Did you have a good season last year? Um. Well, it was really my my first season hunting too. So we flushed. We flushed a few. I never hit one. <laughs> I shot one woodcock. That was it. Well, that reminds me of my first year fly fishing. <laughs> well, it it can only go it it can only get better from there. So good luck on good luck on that. Have you ever hunted behind any pointing dogs too? So you could like compare and contrast, like we had to do in um, high school. I have not. I've you know seen them in action, seen videos mostly. I've seen them at training, but I haven't actually been out hunting with them other than a training situation well well they're both wonderful and i love them all so uh yep. good on you and uh yeah so you're 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 one one check mark in the flusher column i'll put that down and <laughs> and see who see who comes up next with a with a great justification for the opposite column thanks a yeah. lot for being part of the upland nation podcast no problem i appreciate your podcast it's very helpful thank you glad to do it have a great day. Thank you. You too. And I am reminded of the first time I was exposed to a pointing breed. It was mine. I, you know, I wasn't a hunter at the time. Got this dog. Turned out that that dog was a hunting dog. I still didn't know it when we were exercising across the road from our place. And old Bill was going back and forth and back. And then he stopped. And then his right front foot lifted up and his tail went straight into the air and quit quivering. <laughs> there went a hen pheasant and I was hooked. I bought a shotgun the next day and look at me now, mom. Anyway, uh, so that's uh, kind of how I got it started. Uh, Mark Morrison sends me a note and says, one lab is great, two is even better says, although I do like setters, too, but for roosters in public land, labs are ideal. And, you know, Mark, I, I would tend to agree. I joke about it too often, but it's true. If I was going to live in South Dakota and hunt roosters most of the time, I'd probably get a couple, three Labrador retrievers. And it also shows in, in the research I do with folks like you. When I ask everybody what their favorite dog breed is, comes out about even 30% of you love labs the most and 30% love short hairs the most and then all the other breeds go down from there which is fine with me like I said they're all great dogs hanging around with dogs is what we do best and back to the phones we go Dennis is calling from somewhere in Wyoming Dennis how you been I'm been fine excellent I'm fine. Are you uh, chomping at the bit to get out and do some hunting this fall? Oh uh, yeah, I'm I'm a hunting fanatic. I'm ready to go. How are you coping with the? Uh, I described it earlier as house arrest because I'm trying to be politically correct. No, I also called it martial law. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, how are you and your dog uh, coping with this whole kind of shutdown, if you will? You know, it's because of where I live. Um, it's been very little it's made very little difference yeah uh i live in the county and i don't go to town much i'm retired so um 
it just hasn't made a lot of difference to me. I don't do don't do much of anything different now than I did before. You know, it, it it's it's so true, and I'm I'm much the same way. You know, I I go to town to pick up the mail once a week, and while I'm there, I may as well pick up some groceries. And I I did that today, and I I was a, a little shocked at how many people are wearing face masks out here. And I just yeah, I just got a real political problem with that. But anyway, that we're getting off on a tangent that I don't want to get off on. What kind of dogs do you run? I run English pointers. Okay, so I'm going to say that you would, uh, we would put your check mark in the pointer column. And um, why did you pick pointers over all the other pointing breeds? Um, I have had other pointing breeds, but the the biggest difference for me is hair. <laughs> uh, the lack of. Yeah. Uh, I, I had an English setter. He was a, a great dog, but I swore I'd never go through that hair again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the poor pro guides who use setters because they're pretty and they probably bring in big tips, spend half the night um, cleaning up their dogs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, uh, he was miserable after a long day and so was I. Yeah. I don't blame you. What kind of birds are you hunting out there? Uh, I spend more time on pheasants than anything else. Really? Uh, are you... I do get, I do get uh, some chuckers some huns, and a little bit of sharp tail. You know, you and me might be the only two people on this podcast tonight who um, have hunted chuckers in Wyoming. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I suppose we're both close to the same age, and uh, chuckers for an old guy is a challenge. <laughs> Well, it's that it's my inspiration for going to the gym a lot when we're allowed to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. So tell me, uh, English pointers, they, they got to do something to you. I described my introduction to pointing, you know, to German wire hairs a while ago, but what, what is it about them that trips your trigger? The, the biggest thing in the field is, is to watch them, to watch them work. They're, they're, fast they're intense um fortunately the ones i have now are much more interested in keeping track of where i'm at yeah uh, i have had some that's the the old traditional pointers is uh the world starts at 400 yards <laughs> uh, but the, the these girls i have now they're uh they're a lot more content with uh in that hundred uh 75 to 150 yard range what, which you... suits me pretty well unless we're chucker hunting and, and they seem to know when they're in the chucker country that they can run as hard as they want to yeah and you know it's funny i i think they they figure that out on their own we can probably teach a little bit of it but i get that question about once a month about range and whether you can affect a dog's range i wonder how much of that is um your relationship with the dog do you feel like you have a better or a different relationship with these dogs than the last ones um not so much i mean they're, they're they live in the house they're a yeah. house baby sure uh <clears throat> they're spoiled to death um and they all have been and I, the uh quite as honestly i've had three females and one male and the three females of they're more in tune to where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And the male was a little more hard headed and hard, but he was bred to run. Sure. The, these female, the, the three females I've had, I've been a little bit more careful about um, breeding. Yeah. Uh, when I got my three females, but the male, he was, he was bred to run and run. He did. Well, you know, you're absolutely right. You can do a little bit about all of that, but uh, most of it comes out of the DNA. So um, you've obviously figured that out too. So mm -hmm. good for you, and uh, and keep your fingers crossed for the season opening on time and without all the silly rules that uh, they're trying to jam down our throats. Great to talk with you, Dennis. Have a great fall. Good luck over the summer. Get those dogs in good shape, and uh, see you in the field. Thanks. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Dennis has a comrade in Kent who writes on Facebook, I hunt open country, so a big running pointing breed is what works best for me. 
but Kent can't make up his mind. I feel your pain, Kent. He says it could be Brits, it could be setters, or it could be English pointers. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if you could have all of them and somebody to take care of them and clean out the kettle at the end of the day? Oh, well, here we are, shovel in hand. So the debate goes on, pointers versus flushers. And, um, you know, if I could have one of each, like I said, I would. But uh, now it's Angie's turn. Angie's calling right now. Angie, welcome to the program. What kind of dog you running? Right now I've got a German short-haired pointer. Just yeah. the one. There's going to be more in the future here because I recently moved to a place that will accommodate more than one. Nice. Well, but, congratulations yeah. on that. Yeah. And uh, will the yeah no it's pretty exciting. Will the new ones be short hairs as well? Probably at least one for sure. I'm thinking about possibly getting a nice field bred lab as well. There you go. So you you know if I'm going to put you in one of the columns, I'm going to have to put your name twice. I think once for flusher <laughs> and once for la you know a lab uh, pointers. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, I used to uh, apprentice for a dog trainer that was a lab guy, and I've gotten really fond of them as well. Well, you're lucky you had that kind of an introduction. You probably learned a little bit more about them from somebody who actually can lobby on their behalf. You know, some people, I don't care what breed it is, but some people will, will learn all the bad parts about a breed and uh, mm -hmm. and never go back to them again. So are you yep. are, are you a dog trainer now, or, or was that yes. just a, okay? Yeah, that was part of the decision to move out to this bigger place um, because I was working out of another guy's kennel for a while, just small scale. Uh -huh. But now I've kind of set out on my own. And <laughs> well, good luck for that. We're going to get rolling here this summer. Oh, excellent. I wish you the best. Uh, go ahead and plug your business. What's it called, and do you have a website address yet? Uh, yeah, my website is actually www.elitesportdogs, all one word, dot com. Um, you can find me on there. I'm also on Facebook. I'm still learning the social media stuff, though. Um, but yeah, we're in Nanton, Alberta, just west of there. So we're right at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. And so it's really kind of nice because I've got everything from really nice, thick forest brush cover to wide open flat prairie all within a half an hour drive. I'm going to have to come and visit. One of my bucket list <laughs> trips is Alberta for sharp tails. I couldn't care less about the pea fields and the ducks. I just want to chase those sharpies up there. And you know what? The place where I'm living, it's legal to shoot them, and they are quite plentiful. Oh, absolutely. I'm <laughs> careful now. And now we know where to find you. <laughs> So, uh, good. Yeah, it's a great place to be training dogs for sure. Well, you know, you, you have a unique perspective. You, you worked for a lab trainer in effect, and, and now you're a short hair person, at least in large part at mm -hmm. the moment, you know, how would you compare the two? And I mean, granted, they both have great attributes. So what, what would those be for each of those types of dogs? You know, I, I love them both very much but for di very different reasons. And it really just depends on what you want in a dog, right? So, I mean, with the labs, they're a very easy breed to train, which is a check in their column for sure. They stay very close and they don't naturally want to range out, which is really good for control, especially if you're not, you don't have a lot of practice at controlling dogs at a distance. It's difficult. So labs range shorter and they're kind of better for that. And they also have the benefit, well, I say labs, but I guess we're talking about pointing dogs and flushing dogs, not just labs, so that it would include all your spaniels and stuff sure. like that. Um, but a flushing dog is better if you're hunting like that tight bush cover mm -hmm. because they're staying closer to you. And if you have a pointing dog that goes on point, well, now there's deadfall everywhere and those grouse, they sit tight and you darn near have to step on the things to get them to flush Jay, so with a flushing dog <laughs> yeah they'll do it for you exactly they just put the bird up for you they have a better shot of finding it than you ever will because oh, yeah. sometimes those grouse are sneaky and the flushing dog has a huge advantage there but yeah. with the pointers 
So, like, I mean, if I head further east and I get out to some of that more open grassland prairie type area, I would say the wind definitely goes to the pointing dogs. Because the pointing dogs, they're running bigger and they're going to find birds that you would never find with a flushing dog. Like, they're going into all sorts of different places and they definitely have the wind there. All right. Especially so, since those prairie boards are a little more likely to get up on their own for you. So you, you've been there and done that. What is the trick to getting those dogs to hold a covey of sharp tails until you can get there? How do you, how do you go about the training process? Well, <laughs> a lot of it, you got to start with a set of good genetics is number one. If you don't have a dog with good genetics, it's very difficult to do. Um, especially if you want to keep them to keep intensity on that point and not get bored after a while and just check out. You need good genetics, number one. And for two, it's just a lot of time invested on a lot of birds. Yeah, yeah. So right, and taking it very slowly. You don't want to rush it. Like, everybody's in a big rush. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, my year-old German short hair is pointing birds super hard, and they're bragging about it. But take it your time because the more time and the slower you take it the better they're gonna be now you you know you and everybody else says the same thing and it's easy to say because i say it too it has to be easy if i can say it um yeah train on wild birds the birds will teach the dog steadiness will come with enough bird contacts there's at least one or two other things that we humans can do to help in that process Mm -hmm. isn't there Oh, absolutely. Like, it's not just about the birds. It's about the quality of the bird contact that your dog has. And that's where a lot of the pen-raised birds are good is because they can help you set up scenarios. Yeah. And you can make things happen exactly as you want them to happen, which is a big part of that is just making sure that the dog has as many good experiences on the birds as possible with the least amount of corrections possible. Because if you train it through corrections and force, then what happens is, is the dog's like, oh, well, that guy's not here to make me, so why would I? You have to make them do it out of habit and because they feel like it's the right thing that they need to do. Okay, so I get all that. Uh, I'm a big believer. We're on the same wavelength right now, Angie. All right, so then you go out onto the prairie, eh? And you, your, mm-hmm. dog, your dog hits a point and you're 100 yards away. Or maybe it's the first time and it's a young dog and, and you're close enough. What are you going to do? I mean, what can the human do at that point? Sorry, can I get more clarification from you there? So how do you introduce so that dog to the wild point. birds? So uh, what happens when you uh, take all of that yard training with, with uh, uh, preserved birds or, or with um, pigeons or whatever? Okay, mm-hmm. then the dog's out on the prairie and he's going to hit wild birds. By then, is it a matter of crossing your fingers and hoping all that yard work paid off? Actually, it's a matter of knowing all that yard work paid off. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Don't don't put your dog in a situation you haven't properly prepared them for. If there is a big question, like there's always going to be a little bit of question. Like, I mean, things don't always go the way we want them to, but we can do a lot to stack the odds in our favor and if you're not reasonably confident that that dog is ready for wild birds then try not to do it like sometimes it happens by mistake sure and what you would do in that situation highly depends on the scenario i wish i could give you some pointers on that but it just kind of requires a lot of judgment (laughs) sure based on what's going on because you never like when things go sideways you don't know how they're going to go sideways (laughs) So you kind of have to fly by the seat of your pants a little bit. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, and you're right. You know, I think it was Delmar Smith about a million years ago first said, never give a dog a chance to fail. You rephrased it in the opposite way, but it's the same dang rule. And that is, and, <laughs> you know, stage manage as much of the situation as you can so that you can stage manage it towards success whenever possible yeah i had a mentor of mine that used to say entrapment is legal in dog training 
<laughs> oh, that's great. Well, good. Uh, give us your website for the new business one more time. And, um, and thank you for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Sure. It's www.elitesportdogs.com. That's all one word. And yeah, we've got a whole bunch of different programs on there because I do have Gordon trained. Um, I also specialize in basically helping people to train their own hunting dogs, which unless you're local is kind of difficult. But with the COVID-19 thing, I've actually set up some online training. So people don't actually have to be local to talk to me and get some advice. And I can help them out as much as I can through video chat. There you go. So now you're an international business and you weren't even trying. Right. It, it kind of, it was something I wish I had thought of a long time ago, but it's been actually pretty cool to oh, that, get that see people and their dogs all over North America. Well, good for you and good luck with the new business and uh, watch out. I'll give you plenty of warning if I head up your way so you can go to Saskatchewan instead. <laughs> Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I like it here. Okay, good enough. <laughs> that sounds like the the Wisconsin versus Minnesota debate, but that's for another story. All right. So we like Saskatchewan. They're good buddies of ours. We just like to poke fun at them sometimes. <laughs> and vice versa. I know the feeling. Thanks again for being on the podcast, Angie. Good luck with the business. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. And Joe Amundsen on Facebook says he loves his flushing dog, she can find the birds now if, she, if he can only get her to hold after the flush. Yeah, you know, a lot of people just don't bother with that. and uh, I understand why. I'm still working on steadiness with Flick. Of course, he's a pointer, but that's a different story. And Joe says life is getting more complicated. They just got a puppy pointer. So good luck on both of those, Joe. And uh, good luck to all of you listening out there. Hold on through this quick break because I have some some insights in the handle it segment of the show that should apply to anybody who's got a young dog uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, I'm going to climb on my soapbox, but before I do, here we are. Halfway through the Upland Nation podcast, I'm Scott Linden, your host, and I am a big believer and a longtime user of Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food. Learn more at drtims.com. They've got a large number of formulations, all developed by Tim Hunt, a veterinarian, a sled dog competitor, and a nice guy all around. In fact, so nice that he has arranged for you to get 30% off your first order. Just use the code UPLANDNATION upland nation and you'll get that first order at 30 percent off it's a bargain at twice the price but for this first order 30 percent off and if you heard that message then you probably still have both your ears intact which is a problem for many of us who've been shooting for a long time without hearing protection my friend jack homa over at esp electronic shooters protection has lectured me enough to where even I could hear all the important reasons to wear hearing protection both on the range and in the field. You can learn more about all those reasons at ESPAmerica.com. You know, a gunshot is loud enough to do permanent damage, maybe just a little tiny bit, but multiply that by all the shots you take over your life, and pretty soon all that hearing you had is circling the drain if it's not already going down. Learn more at ESPAmerica.com. All right, welcome to the Handle It segment, brought to you by Cabela's, where they're offering 40% off on select products during their camping classic learn more at cabelas.com and now learn more about why i think everybody who owns or is contemplating owning a young dog needs to learn a little bit more about growth plates you know i did some research because i you know i had a dog that broke a toe i had another dog that broke a toenail so i'm really big on the reasons that happened which are related in a way and it's all about jumping down and jumping up and running too much as a very young dog 
So here's the lecture. Growth plates are that soft area of developing cartilage tissue at the end of the dog, dog's long bones, like their leg bones. Well, they got four leg bones. Let's leave it at that. Gradually, that cartilage will transform into bone. But until it does, any damage done to that cartilage will have long-term, lifelong effects. Let's say a dog jumps off your pickup truck tailgate, lands wrong, damages one side of one piece of cartilage. That's going to stop growing. The other side's going to grow, and pretty soon you're going to have a bow-legged dog on that side. And that's the best result you can expect. So be mindful. Keep your dog's runs short as a puppy, up to about eight months of age is what most people recommend. Some of the bigger dog breeds up to 20 months. Don't let them jump up, don't let them jump down. If you are in such bad shape that you can't lift your dog up into your truck, start going to the gym, man. All right, thank you for putting up with me, but I've just seen so many things that, um, that I wish I hadn't seen in that regard, and it all starts by taking good care of your dog early on in life. Yeah, we're talking about pointers versus flushers. I know that's probably the, the wrong way to look at it. Hey, what do you love about your pointer or your flusher? Maybe that's a more positive way to look at it. We're also looking downrange at fall and all the wonderful things that will happen after our lead is unclipped and we can get out and start doing some things uh, to get ready right around here at least we're lucky enough that we can we can run outside the back gate into the national forest and nobody bothers us at least not yet and by the time that um, you know summer gets around here we hope to be basically back to normal in many ways including our ability to get out and uh, goof off a little with our dogs and our dog training friends and maybe even our fishing buddies if we're so inclined so anyway uh pointers flushers uh nothing quite in between except my dogs on a bad day uh let's get back to the phones so here we are scott is on the line scott where are you calling from by the way uh southeast iowa oh Okay, how was your, uh, well, it's a little early for that. How was last season's bird population? That'd be um, it. It was, it was hit or miss for the most part. I mean, a lot of places with good food and good cover was pretty good, and other places not so good. So it just kind of depended on area, and I don't know. You sound like Some you of... work for the Department of Wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. That's that's the kind of line I'd hear from them, no matter what state I was going to. Well, uh, the, in that case, then how was your season? My season was pretty good. We have some pretty good places to hunt, so um, we got quite a few pheasants, and then um, got into several several pockets of quail. So we had a pretty good year. Well, good on you. And uh, what kind of dog were you following most of the time during that pretty good year? I've got a four-year-old chocolate lab. So I'm going to put your check mark in the flushing breed category. Any reason you picked a Labrador? Well, actually, he points. <laughs> so <laughs> I got to make another column now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, that you know, okay, uh, we got golden doodles labradoodles and now we have flush flush appointers or something like that yeah i'm not sure what you call them but yeah oh, so, so tell me i mean did you know this when you got that dog or no okay i did not right. i um he was the third lab i've had um out of the three he's the second one that's pointed but he's the first one that looks like a pointer when he does it <laughs> um you mean he changes out of his a bushy coat into something a little prettier <laughs> no he, he uh he just looks rock i mean it's rock solid head down tail up foot up i mean it looks like i've hunted behind a lot of pointers <laughs> he yeah. looks like a pointer i love it uh i'll never forget that the first time we we on television we were going to hunt with some pointing labs by the end of that episode i was calling them 
pausing labs. <laughs> That's about all we got out of it. Sounds like you got uh, one of the better ones in that world. Yeah, I hope so. And Did, then we're actually picking up another one tomorrow, a eight week old chocolate lab that is out of some fairly impressive pointing lab hunting trial dog. So nice. So, um, once you figured all this out, ha have you cultivated it anyway? You know, you know what we all go through on the pointer, on the real pointing side. You know, we're <laughs> we're constantly working on this. Are you doing the same thing? Um, I do. <laughs> I, I definitely do not discourage it. Um, but yes, I still do quite a bit of work trying to get them out, get them out on birds. Um, we're just getting into nesting season, so it's kind of limited some things around here but sure um he is he does pretty good and we we've got a couple game farms we can kind of go up there and buy some birds and and run them on that so enjoy doing that too well it sounds like you've got the best of both worlds there do you use that dog uh on waterfowl as well i don't duck hunt a lot yeah. Um, I use, it's kind of one of those things every couple of years I'll go for a couple of years and then I won't go for a couple of years. And it, one year it was really, really dry and there's no water hardly anywhere. So the ducks didn't really stick around. They just kind of went right through and I didn't go that year. And that's been probably three years ago. So he hadn't had much of an opportunity to do any duck hunting, but well, so it, so it sounds like you're, yeah, the, the, if, if you were to prioritize, you'd, you, you, at the top of your list would be Labrador. At, uh, right below that would be Pointing. Uh, but it, it, did you look at any of the, you know, the more common, if you will, Pointing breeds before you went to this third dog? Um, I, I seriously considered getting a German short hair. Um, Oh, probably a year and a half ago, and I actually had one, a litter found, and was really interested in doing it, and then just kind of the timing wasn't right, so kind of held off, and then really liked what I was seeing out of my dog. He was younger at the time, so liked what I was seeing out of him, so I just kind of held off, and then this year, the timing was just right, and it just happened to be um, a litter of pups that are fairly close to home to where I could go down and kind of spend some time with them and pick out the one I want and and see the parent or see the mother and then read about the dam I, or the sire I guess so mm -hmm. well good on you yeah uh, you know it was a very deliberate uh intentional decision and it sounds like it worked out real well for you good for you yep. let's uh, let's hope that um uh the the populations uh, continue to grow down there i've enjoyed every trip i've made to iowa hope to get there again in the meanwhile we are going to hunt this fall so get ready now and thanks for being a part of the upland nation podcast yep thank you very much little further south and east we made an episode out in uh, florida at one of those quail plantations many many years ago and it was my first experience with what are now becoming the fashionable flushing breed at, at places like that whether it's the east or the west or the southeast or the southwest and that's those little field bred cocker spaniels I, uh, I'll never forget it. It was the first time, uh, we had worked with them and, and that little puppy that we worked with one of those days. Um, in fact, you can still watch that episode in, on YouTube if you want a very young puppy and a gigantic, the, our guide was about six foot eight and that puppy was about four pounds. I swear to God, but that dog loved that owner so much it would flush those birds out and then after the bird is shot and even the puppy was bringing some back over the course of the day that puppy would get up a head of steam from 10 yards away from his guide owner and leap into that guy's arms and i tell you every cocker spaniel on every episode of wing shooting usa since has done that for us on camera without any encouragement. It's just one of the many things I love about little cockers. Uh, Levi Shank on Facebook says he loves his lab, but depending on the game, his lab will point or flush. <laughs> okay, as long as you work that out in advance, send him an email and uh, make sure you both agree at 
what you're going to do. I, I love the idea. Barry Evans on Facebook says he likes both pointing breeds and flushing breeds, and they can work together in combination. Yeah, they can. See it all the time. And uh, most of the time, it works pretty well. So pointers, flushers, something in between, part-time of each, you know, uh, whatever floats your boat, I say. Uh, how about you, Jack? What do you say? Pointers or flushers? You know, uh, I've always enjoyed watching all dogs, but for me, I like the close hunting pointing breeds. Close hunting pointing breeds. Uh, you're, you must be up in the woods somewhere. Uh. Yeah, a little bit. Do a little bit of rough grouse hunting, mainly pheasant. Mm -hmm. uh, just can do a lot of everything. I just, yeah, I like the close hunting dogs because I love watching them work. Well, isn't that the truth? I mean, that's what got most of us into this game was being able to watch those dogs. And I, I just never thought about it before. But, you know, although I love my GPS collar and I love getting the little beep when my, my collar says he's on point 300 yards away over that ridge. There is something to be said for watching him hit that point, isn't there? Yes, yes. There's nothing more exciting to me than watching my dog lock up on point. And, you know, um, it's the same for me. I mean, it's what got me into it, and it still works. What kind of dogs you run in these days? I've got two, uh, and I'm going to apologize right now. I'm going to butcher it. I always do. But they're Drenza Patrishond dogs. Oh, Dutch partridge yeah, dog. yeah, from the Netherlands, sure. Yep. Yeah, and say it once again for us, because you might be the the best pronoun pronouncer of that those words. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but it's uh, Drensa Patrishund. Um, yeah, like you said, they originate in the Netherlands. Uh, we mainly just call them a a Drent. That's what sure. most people call them and just amazing dogs to hunt with why don't you and, describe their looks first well they look like a tall uh springer spaniel kind of with a full tail instead of the docked tail or a a moonster launder mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're delivering white uh yeah just beautiful dogs and uh and the heavier uh, heavier coat than some dogs you know the, yeah. um do they um the body type uh you said springer um you know not skinny not bulky right in between yeah. there yeah right in between uh quite a bit well taller than a springer yeah uh they definitely got longer legs and yeah, just, yeah, amazing family dogs, too. I can't say enough about how good they are as family dogs. That's great. Um, what kind of hunting style do they have? Obviously, they work close for you. Is that kind of what they're known for? Yeah, they're, a, I believe, mainly a close to mid-range dog. They'll get out a oh, couple hundred yards, maybe at the most. Uh, they like to stay close by and keep keep an eye on me as as well. They are always constantly checking in with me in the thick brush, especially. Nice. Would you call them um, quick, nimble, or deliberate? Uh, deliberate, I'd say. They're a little slower and methodical on the way they hunt. I, I, I mean this in the best possible way, but you probably, in the course of finding a dog with a funny name like that, probably run into, uh, you know, a, a few Spinoni Italianos over the years. As yeah. well. and, yes. and, and they're, they're deliberate times too. Um, uh, but uh, you're, you're not in that league with your Drent, are you? Not quite that league, no. Okay. No. So so nobody nobody goes to sleep after they plant the birds for the Spinoni Italiano Navda puppy test, <laughs> if you know what I mean. 
Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, good for you, and uh, glad to have. Where did you find those? Well, I got my first pup, Loki. He's nine now. I got him out of uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho, from a guy named John Lambrix of Dutch Boy Kennels. Love it. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of the DPCNA, the United States Club for the Breed. Um, I read an article in the Gun Dog magazine about him, fell in love with him, found out that John lived 20 minutes away from me, and went and met with him, and a year later had one of his puppies. Well, good for you. How about the second one? Same place, or did you go somewhere else? No. Second one, um, I actually went over to Belgium to get. Wow. Uh, Because there's only about maybe 300 uh, dogs in the U.S. right now and only about three litters a year. Well, then you deserve a medal for uh, uh, making the gene pool a little bit deeper. Good on you. Um, that, that is, that is a big problem in many breeds, but geez, in that breed, it sounds like it might be as bad as almost all the others put together. Yeah. It's the bloodline is real thin here in the U S and always trying to expand on it and make it better. Well, good for you. If you uh, had to narrow it down to the one thing you love most about your drent in the field, what would it be? Uh, desire is what I'd say. The desire to hunt and please. Yeah. How do you see that in them? Is it, uh, is it the look in there, the steely gaze, or is it something a little bit more fun than that? Yeah. The, the energy I would say is what I noticed the most is at home they're super laid back gentle dogs but as soon as you get them out in the field and get a they see the shotgun come out their energy level goes to 10 and they are just the excitement is just fun to watch with them i love it i have to hold the whistle lanyard with two hands so that nothing rattles no matter where i am or else flick thinks he's going hunting yep well good for you and uh, good to learn a little bit more about a breed that most of us will never meet in our entire lives. But I'll do. I'll, I'll make you this promise, everybody. I'll try and find a picture and put it up on the website uh, for the podcast. So go to UplandNation.com and look down there when this podcast is on the air and you'll be able to see a picture. I bet I know where I can find one. And with that, Jack, thanks for the um, introduction to the dogs. I was going to say Dutch dogs. Yeah, that's what the, that's yeah. what they are. Yeah. Uh, and uh, good luck uh, as the season approaches. We will be hunting. I'm keeping my eyes on the prize, as I imagine you are too. So, yes, have, I am. Have a great fall. Thanks for being part of the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you. And have a great evening. And Greg Zimmerman uh, writes on Facebook that he likes to hunt over flushers, springers in particular, because they hunt close. Hey, I get it. And he knows exactly where they are 99% of the time. I, I'm detecting a trend here, and, and there are times uh, I know exactly how you both feel, Greg and Jack, our last caller for for that. There are times when a 300, 400, and 500 yard dog isn't exactly what you want, but there are other times when they are perfect and i'm thinking of a hunt in let's see where was it northwest nevada last january that will be forever etched in my memory okay i'll tell you so the collar says flicks on point 295 yards that way so i'm thinking oh, i'll never get there in time but he's done that three or four times this season and he actually held that point while the birds held still and waited for me Polite dog, polite birds. So I hightail it over there uh, as fast as I can safely, which means no running. Gun broken open. Get to the top of the ridge. I see him down there. I get to that spot, and I'm probably, you know, 50 yards from where I think the birds are. 
which is not quite close enough for me. You've seen me shoot on TV. But in the covey, 99% of those birds flew straight away from Flick and me. And the one slow chucker, and I mean mentally slow, clearly, flew right at me. I had to shoot it out of self-defense. It's the least I could do for Flick. He held that point for 15 minutes while I got there. And he deserved a retrieve, and he got one. In fact, I think I got a picture of that somewhere on my website, findbirdhuntingspots.com. Go over there, look for a young Flick with a chucker in his mouth. He's just picking it up. That's what he's doing. Anyway, whoo, love it. Oh, the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. Yeah, pointers, flushers, something in between. I don't mind. I'll take one or two of five of each if I if I could get permission around here. But that's uh, that's my problem, not yours. Connor, welcome to the program. How are you? Good. How are you? I am having a great day talking dogs with everybody from Drent Partridge Hunds. I think that's how I would pronounce it, but I'm not from there. To pointing labs, uh, to labs that point or flush, depending on their mood, I guess. How about you? What do you got in your kennel? Uh, I run uh, flushing labs, and my female every so often will point. Um, does she ask permission, or do you have a little chat, or do, is this just like a, a you know sporadic? You know, it's with her. It's sporadic. It's just kind of however she feels that day. What do you do when that? I mean, did did uh, did, did, did were you surprised the first time you saw that? I was very surprised. I never um, usually most labs I run they've always been flushers. Um, I hunt usually upland, usually grouse here in Michigan, northern Michigan. So it's, um, we get grouse and woodcocks. So, um, usually I hunted with a, a fellow up there that we would hunt his pointers with my labs. And, um, uh, we took, you know, we took her out to a, um, to our farm here and, uh, she had pointed, she was running around and acting all birdie. And the next thing I knew she pointed and it just, it blew my mind so um when it happens or maybe even the first time but since it's happened a lot more uh, ever get you thinking about getting a pointing breed next time or do you just love the labs um i love the labs and my dad seems to love the pointers so we kind of get best of both worlds when we hunt together that's great and they, and they get along and they actually work together pretty well yes yep it's um Usually we won't run them together till they're both done and fully trained. So we're not trying to confuse the pointer thinking he can flush and the, you know, we don't want to create any future problems there, but once they're, they're fully trained, I mean, it's, I have a riot doing it. Well, so, um, because I haven't asked anybody else yet, and I probably should dig into this a little deeper with a pro, but, um, so by fully trained, I mean, you, you come to the party with, with Labradors and your dad comes with pointing breeds. Are those pointers trained to let the, the Labrador do the flushing or how, how does it work in your hunting situation? Well, when we introduce them together, um, we'll get some, some pigeons or Bob whites and let them go. And then when we run them together, you know how it is with the wool command. Sure. Um, once once we first introduce them it tend we tend to notice that the pointers want to go in with the my labs to flush so i mean it, it does take a few fruit few trial runs for them and then once they figure it out it's just kind of a you know the pointers know their jobs and my flushers know theirs as long as they will respond to the woe command right yes yeah yep great well good for you and how was your season by the way um, it, we didn't, um, we did a lot more waterfowl hunting this year. Uh, we we tend to lean towards that a little bit, but I mean, we, I can't complain about how the year went. We put up some birds and, um, missed a few and got a few. Well, I know that first part pretty well. The miss part. <laughs> oh yeah. I think everybody out there does. Yeah. How are you coping with this, uh, lockdown? Are you able to work with your dog a little bit? Are you getting out? Are you doing the things with your hunting buddies that you would normally be doing or how, how's that working for you? Uh, training wise. I mean, that, I mean, that proceeded, um, I live out here, you know, where nobody really bothers you. So, um, we've got a, a family farm. It's a, it's close to 200 acres. So I'll get my dogs out and run blinds or, 
you know, we've got some birds on the property that right now, currently, I'm not running them because the birds are nesting, but um, I'll take them out with bumpers and launchers. And um, so training wise, I mean, it's still going good. Well, you're lucky. There are some people who can't even get around to that. Theoretically, every time I leave the property, I'm breaking the law. But, uh, uh, hey, Governor Brown, come on, handcuff me, I dare you. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. I'll be the test case in the Supreme Court. But um, don't get me started on that. <laughs> I, I agree. So, yeah. so if if you know if you if you were just walking around in the woods looking for woodcock and rough grouse with your pointing Labrador, I mean, yeah, uh, with your flushing Labrador, what what or whatever it is, I, I want to be inclusive here. Um, what is the thing that gets you most excited about working with that dog? Oh, just watching how the dogs work. To be honest, I mean, I feel like anybody that once you get a dog, you, you know, you're hunting kind of, you stop enjoying pulling the trigger a little bit less and enjoy watching them dogs work a lot more. Isn't that the truth? You ever hunt without a gun? I have. Um, <laughs> usually, usually when I have a brand new puppy, her, his or her first year, um, every time I take him out, I, I honestly won't bring a gun. I'll let everybody else shoot and I'll handle the dog. I, you know, I'm doing that more and more often. I've even done it on the TV show a few times. I'm going to do it a little bit more from now on. I think I'm, I'm to that point. Plus flick needs all the help he can get. So, uh, well, good that's, for you. That's one thing I've noticed after, you know, even working with a client's dog, you know, you, I feel like you've, you, you wean out a lot more future problems if you leave the gun at home and focus on the dog. Okay, so you just said the magic word, client. Uh, so, do you do this for a living? I I try. Um, I have a. <laughs> I have well, another. So do I. I'm not a dog trainer, but I play one on TV. <laughs> yeah, that's what. Um, I I work in construction full time, and I do train dogs on the side. So it's. Um, I'm hoping one day that I'll get good enough to where I can. I can just train dogs. Well, good luck to you, and I hope it works. In the meanwhile, as a part-time pro, what's the biggest mistake we make when we, you know, before we bring our dog to you for the real training? Um, honestly, I, I think a lot of people just they rush their dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a fellow contact me just the other day, and you know he's got a he's about oh I want to say he was an eleven. 11 month old um, Chesapeake and he's trying to run double retrieves with him. And, and I told him that should be the last of your, your thoughts right now at a, you know, that young of a dog, you still got a lot to learn. So I, I personally think that people just will sometimes will put too much pressure on the dog or overwork the dog. And it's really, you're really slowing your progress down for the future. Yeah, uh, my good friend and, and my wire hair breeder uh, trainer that I, I get my dogs from made made the same point last week. He said, uh, young dogs don't have the resilience to recover from the failures that they they have to endure when they're forced to do things when they're not ready for it. I, that's a, that's not the best way to put it, but um, it's what you just described. Those dogs, they just, they're not ready for that stuff. If they blow it when they're not ready, all of a sudden you got some makeup work in there, don't you? Yes. Yes, you do. Well, good luck on that. I hope you do become one. It sounds like you got the right attitude and um, it sounds like you're looking forward to the fall like the rest of us. What's the first place you're going to go? When you're um, when you're out for the first for opening weekend, well, for for us here in Michigan, our uh, our waterfall season actually starts before our our grouse season does. So we'll probably hit hit the cut wheat fields first, and then once uh usually later in September rolls around, then we'll start hitting um the northern Michigan with our dogs, seeing if we can't get some woodcocks or grouse. All right. Well, it sounds good. At least you're looking forward. That's our goal today is to keep everybody looking forward. And, and we'll never settle the question, flushers versus pointers, but we'll get closer. At least we'll all be more enlightened in part thanks to you. Connor, great to have you on the Upland Nation podcast. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. Oh, enlightening in so many ways. I am 
you know, I always, I love learning stuff and I don't care what it is. I read the backs of the cereal boxes because there's something in there I really need to know. But I also love talking about dogs of all sorts. I, I am, what do they call it? Uh, ecumenical. I, I, I love every breed. I love every dog in every breed. And I love to watch them work because to them work is not work at all. It's play. And we never get enough of that. I mean, the veterinarians will tell us the dogs don't have the musculature to actually smile. But if you watch a dog, especially your own dog, working in the field on a hunt, you know that dog is smiling, if not outwardly, at least inwardly. We got way more to cover here, including another public access location for you that I can personally highly recommend, which might surprise you a little bit as well. But first, a couple quick messages. First, from my friends at Gunner Kennels. Gunner.com is where you learn more about all the sizes and all the accessories and all the reasons Gunner is the only five-star uh, crash-rated kennel in the entire known world they're offering financing yeah they're not cheap but how much is your dog worth especially if you lose it and i well we won't even go there financing is available these are heavy duty crates but gunner doesn't let you swallow the cost they'll offer you free shipping on all the crates at gunner.com and speaking of deals Write this down, S-L-U-N-10. That'll get you 10% off any purchase over 200 bucks at dogtra.com. Whether you're looking for a training collar, um, a beeper, a bark collar, or anything else, Dogtra probably has a solution to your particular problem. For me, it's Flick's steadiness and retrieving abilities Two collars, the T and B dual collar is my solution there. It's working extremely well because you don't have to toggle back and forth on a touch screen. There's two sets of buttons, one for each collar. And free shipping on everything over 200 bucks as well. So take a look at all your options at dogtra.com. This land is your land, my home state back in the day. Finally grew up and left it. Best move I ever made, California. Was great back in the day, especially if you were in the music business, but that's a story for another day. This land is your land is brought to you by findbirdhuntingspots.com where you can get more details on all of the stuff I talk about right here and... If you sign up for the mailing list, you could win a pointer shotgun. The state bird is the valley quail. I love that. I never appreciated it when I was living down there, but I appreciate it now when I go back. If you're looking for valley quail and you have to be in California and you followed all the rules about firearms and ammo and signed up and got the permits and did all that, they're in the humid lowlands, the desert, and just about anywhere else, the challenge becomes finding public ground. You're going to find that in the Los Padres National Forest near Ventura. Or if you're in the southern half, of the, that's if you're in the southern half of the state. Up north, I'm kind of liking Lassen and Modoc National Forests. Maybe I'll see you there. This land is your land. Welcome to it. Quick mention, ESPamerica.com. Learn more about hearing protection because hearing loss is permanent. Nobody's going to inject you with anything. They'll give your eardrums the strength they need to start hearing your wife nagging at you or sending you a message like that. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. But not before saying thank you to all of our callers all of our Facebook commenters, and all of you who listened. I hope you'll tell your friends. I hope you'll rate or review this podcast wherever you get it. It helps. Believe me, it helps a lot. And when you do that, you're entered to win that pointer shotgun as well. I'm open to talking just about any time if it comes to birds, 
bird hunting and bird dogs. Go to the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page, the Upland Nation Facebook page. And you can listen to all sorts of podcasts going way back to when I didn't know what I was doing on this board at UplandNation.com. I do see the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe you do too. Maybe your dog does. Maybe your hunting buddies do. We will have a season. Keep the faith. Watch that Hope Help Hunt video on YouTube or at findbirdhuntingspots.com and stay motivated and help out the Rough Grouse Society at the same time. Get closer to your family, reach out to your friends, and spend some serious quality time with your dogs. Thanks again. I'm Scott Linton. Appreciate your listening to the Upland Nation Podcast.